Okay. Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to see you here on a Friday to get a dose of literary sustenance along with your lunch at this session of the Wheeler Centre's Double Booked Club. My name is Jacqueline Krupe, and I'm a bookseller at the Hill of Content and a book editor. And I'm delighted to be in conversation with Anna Crean and Fable Parrot to discuss their new books, Acts of Grace and There Was Still Love. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So between them, these two writers have been shortlisted for, or won, nearly every literary prize you could name. Anna Crean, on my far left, is the author of Into the Woods, an intimate exploration of Tasmania's forestry industry, Night Games, an unflinching reportage into the dark side of footy culture, and several brilliant quarterly essays. We have come to think of her, at least I have, as a narrative non-fiction writer, but with Act of Grace, her first novel, she's shown her incredible skill at crafting fiction. Weaving multiple narrative strands together, Anna interrogates the effects and meanings of memory. It's a book about identity and what we inherit from families, trauma and history. Favel Parrot is the author of Past the Shallows, a hauntingly beautiful work about three brothers, and When the Night Comes, a story of a lonely young girl and a good ship. Her latest novel, There Was Still Love, transports us from Prague to Melbourne and back again, capturing a beautiful and heart-wrenching European immigrant story. The guilt of those who've departed, the struggle of those left behind, and the love, however distant, that forever binds them. We're so incredibly lucky to have these two writers with us and the space here at the Wheeler Centre to talk about fiction. This event is being live streamed today. We have Josh from Readings as our bookseller and Anna and Favor will be signing copies of their books at the end of this event. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions, so please be sure to get some ready. Please join me in welcoming our guests today. <laughs> okay. So both these books have such wonderful and revealing titles. I'm going to start with the titles, guys. <laughs> Anna, can you tell us a bit about <clears throat> where the title Act of Grace comes from? Yeah, so Act of Grace, uh, about well, maybe six years ago now, I was doing an a article um, speaking to returned veterans, uh, mostly from Iraq and Afghanistan. And a soldier who'd come back from Iraq was um, one of my interviewees. And he told me about these payments called Acts of Grace. And uh, I learned from him that they're a kind of compensation payment made to, in his case, Iraqi civilians who have been harmed or hurt or had family who's been harmed or hurt or killed unintentionally by the Australian military. And they were not, um, they weren't, they weren't things that definitely would happen, but if the Australian uh, government fought, why not, in this case, have an act of grace, um, they may occur. And it kind of struck me as a really Orwellian mm. term to have an act of grace, in, in particularly in that war, um, which is our longest running war that we've been involved in. Um, and I based this novel around a, an act of grace. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the title takes on more and more significance as you read the book because you come to realise, you know, there are several acts of grace, yeah. really. Mm. Yeah. Um, Favor, what are the origins of your book title and can you talk a little bit about how you incorporate it into the book? Yeah, this is the only title that I've had from the start oh. that's survived. Stuck. <laughs> so I have working <laughs> titles that change and yeah. morph. But this one was really strong and it stayed with me. There was still love. It means many different things. There's still love for my grandparents, huge love, maybe even more than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, but in communist Prague, with everything that was going on, there was still love. There was still sex. There were still babies being born. There were still people dying. Kids still went to school. There was still ordinary life going on, and that's what I wanted to capture, not a caricature of what we imagine growing up in communist Prague would be like. Yeah, absolutely, and you certainly achieved that. So both of your books grapple with the pain of being cut off, from family and home, in the case of Manor and Bill in your book, Fable, from culture and country, in the case of Nassim, Danny and Robbie, and of course Danny from memory as well, in your book, Anna. Could you talk to this pain, this pain of being cut off, 
and how you probe it in your books. Mm. <laughs> you go. I, it's, a, um, it's a hard one. Mine is um, told from two grandchildren that are trying to understand this pain and trauma that their grandmas <coughs> carry, um, which is interesting as a writer to, to try and get enough across from a child point of view, looking at these two atlases that have held up the world but have been through so much and really take so much fear and pain into their mm. own flesh. Um, and have done for a long time. Um, yeah, that was, um, I loved trying to um, show that through children's eyes, trying to understand this trauma of separation. My book is about two twin sisters that were separated just before World War II. One had to go to London, f fled to London, the other is stuck in Prague and that is then forever yeah. after the war. So they're separated forever and um, both of them have different traumas and um, there's a resentment between them but also a deep love. It's an interesting relationship. It really is, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I guess uh, there's sort of four characters, main characters in here and they have such uh, different backgrounds. Um, and I guess there, there's various ways of being cut off. There's the obvious uh, experience of being cut off from your country, mm -hmm. of being an immigrant. Um, then there's the, uh, the, the, again, that being cut off from your country even while you're still there as mm -hmm. well, still feeling absolutely connected to the dirt but not to the regime. Uh, and then there's um, two more characters who have been cut off from their culture and then there's also in the character of Tui, who's the returned soldier, um, he's, um, he's sort of that embodiment of, uh, someone recently said he's the embodiment of toxic masculinity, but I do, I am sort of wary of that term because it can seem so dismissive, but he's cut off from any possibility of comfort yeah. and reassurance. He is so, um, he is he's his body and his mind is a nightmare and um it he would not allow any comfort to get through um and so he's someone who's just cut off i guess from warmth absolutely mm. um i don't want to freak anyone out but the timer isn't counting down <laughs> so i'm happy to talk all day <laughs> that's fine okay great um so both your books speak to the lived price of war um, the sacrifices people make to survive and the freedoms we have in Australia. I think you're both sort of alluding to those. Um, can you tell us a bit about your thinking about war? You're obviously talking about different wars, but they're both wars, and how you chose to humanise it, or in your case, and perhaps dehumanise it in your mm. books? Yeah, well, I mean, I was... became quite obsessed with the Iraq war and... Um, did, got into my journalist mode, which was research the bejesus out of everything. Um, <laughs> and then sort of realised that uh, this like most recent chapter in Australia's uh, uh, war history has not really been explored in our mm. literature. So I sort of realised if you were to sort of excavate this particular time in our lives, then, and only to read Australian literature, you would never know that we've been yeah. involved in a 12-year war yeah, in Iraq and you would never know that this war was conducted in, in the face of intelligence, conducted in the face of massive public, uh, um, uh, massive public uh, refusal mm -hmm. of wanting to go uh, <coughs> um, and, you know, largely based on some real misleading, very kind misleading, misleading politicians. And I do, for me personally, I feel like a lot of what we're currently experiencing today in politics um, and the erosion of trust in democracy, um, you can, we could, we could link it back to when we were really let down quite recently by mm. our politicians with the decision to go into Iraq. So. Yeah, so I was really keen to explore Iraq in a literary way. Mm. Yep. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. It's so true what you say, that it's not present in our literature. 
And, mm. yeah. and America's so good at that. Yeah, like America will like, yeah. you know, they'll do their short stories yeah. and they'll have their writers that yeah. constantly memorialising yeah. every wall that they're in and, and digging out the skeletons and, and looking at it from all angles. And Australia is sort of like this, this is this amnesia. Yeah. 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 I wonder if we did need a journalist, someone with a journalistic background to come to it, though, to sort of point that out and probe it um, the way you have. Mm. I mean, can, who knows? Hayley? Mine's more um, the absence of the war in that mm. my grandparents never talked about the past at all. I know nothing about them or very little. I knew them for the 16 years that I had them in my life and I was... Um, a kid and then a teenager oh. and, and totally self-absorbed. I didn't even think of a life before me until mm. much later and then they're gone. Um, but that was a generation that having got through that time never spoke about it again. Mm. It was all about looking forward, especially migrants that, cha that moved the country. It was about this new future and the new generation only. Yeah. So um, I found that really fascinating trying to um, find out anything about my grandparents, how, what they were like when they were young, how they met, why my grandma had to leave Czechoslovakia is still <coughs> a complete mystery. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make up a lot of stuff in this novel. Sure. Yeah. Um, so your books are about returning to a past that you um, as well as your readers are able to feel the tremors of today. Um, and you sort of talked about this a little bit, but how are you <coughs> using the past to talk about what interests you in the present? Because I feel like you're both doing that. Mm. Um, the, um, the notion of, um, I guess as writers, maybe we're trying to make people feel mm. and not feel sad or happy mm. or anything, but just feel. So um, if you can, be in someone else's mind, in their body, experience their life in words, it, it changes you, you feel differently afterwards. Um, I mean, this is a book about, um, I mean, I want people to read the suitcase bit at the start of my book and know that this has never stopped, that war mm. and refugees has never stopped <coughs> and that Australia's uh, lack of compassion and um, acceptance of the other is is stronger than ever. Mm. Um, we've really lost our way in the last 20 years, really lost our way. And um, it's tragic, it's really sad. So mm. that's it there. I yeah. yeah, I agree. I think that, um, yeah, I, that the role of literature is is uh, a, a, an attempt that we hope is successful for people to feel and to sort of um, get beyond binaries. So mm. there are no such thing as good characters. Mm. There are no such thing as evil characters. Yeah. Everyone's uh, nuanced, everyone's complicit and so forth. Um, and I don't think literature's role has ever, has, has, has always been that. I don't think mm. we're doing anything different or extraordinary, except that I think we're increasingly in a time where we need we need more and more pushback against stereotypes against caricatures mm. against cliches against um really binary um so-called issues uh, it's this or it's this these sort of false choice issues mm. they should be in or they should be out or you know we should recognize our past or not as opposed to well, there are so many other smarter ways to go about this. And if we have characters that embody a really rich, nuanced, and not always perfect characters, mm. um, I think hopefully that could, you know, help uh, just just c contribute to a more intelligent conversation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think fiction is in some ways uniquely placed to do that because, as you say, it does make us feel. Um, mm. And... You know, as writers, you are trying to sort of probe our emotions and sort of mine and place us in these characters mm. um, in a way that non-fiction perhaps can't. I do um, get scared of the word feelings now because <laughs> it's so... Um, someone, I mean, I was oh. recently talking about Iraq and how so much can stem, like, sort of this idea of truth and what is truth at the moment and fake news and 
stemming it from the Iraq war. And then a friend of mine quoted, well, what about the Reagan quote? There was a Ronald Reagan quote in his time when he was like, I know these are the facts and the facts are true, but in my heart, my heart feels they are false. And so <laughs> all the way back yeah. then, we were, di we were grappling with, yeah, with right. these really, really problematic issues. And it's kind of, I sort of feel like I want people to feel, but I want people also to know what are feelings and what is truth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's kind of like a, That's so it's a dance. Yeah. yeah, that actually leads beautifully to my next question. Um, and it's about tone. These books are tonally <laughs> completely different. I don't know if you felt that reading each other's <laughs> work. Um, but Fable, your book is quiet and just truly incredibly beautiful. Um, all of your books have made me cry. So this one was no exception. So you're three for three, well done. Um, Anna, your book is bold, it's structurally complex. Um, Margaret Atwood was recently asked what advice she would give a debut novelist today. And she said, go in screaming. And it made me think of your book. I feel like you went in screaming and I loved it. Um, this might be an impossible question to answer. It's not going to stop me from asking it. How did you establish tone in your books? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. You just have to feel it. Yeah. You have to feel everything 20 times greater than it's on, it's on the page. Like you have to feel... Yeah. Tone, it's something you can't um, fake, Right. I don't think. Yeah. It, it's, you have to feel it. There has to be that much passion to, like, carry this, to create a world that's going to hold and um, all the time it takes and um, it's a quite painful process. But you have to just feel, like, everything. And it has to be all-consuming so that when I'm in a book writing it is 90% of my brain all the time right mm. and I'm missing so you're missing from friends from your husband from you but not there you're not in the, the real world because I'm absolutely 100% in this have to be all the time yeah, right. so that's the only way I know how to <coughs> do it mm. yeah I'm I would like to be in there all the time, but I can't. I've got between 9.30 and 3 o'clock. <laughs> um, and hours. then some nights and some week, maybe some weekends to work. Um, the children call. Uh, I'm not sure if it's tone or if it's an answer to the going in screaming. but um, <laughs> We'll take either. Yeah, either. <laughs> um, but I, when I began this, I sort of I began with quite, um, as my journalism, you mentioned my journalism, I began very much using my journalism muscle, which was doing all my research. And it was also quite limited in the sense that I mm. felt like I was doing my research to build a character of an Australian soldier. But then two years in, I suddenly found myself having obviously been so um, armed with research that I suddenly found myself writing a chapter based in Baghdad and then found myself writing the character of Saddam and the character yeah. of Saddam's son, Uday. And then I went, oh, <laughs> all right, this is, this is good. Yeah. Like, this is not, this is where f fiction can do so many more, or not more, but different things to journalism. And I guess that's when I found my stride and my tone because mm. I initially had sort of been quite limited of what, what, can, what can I write about, what can I know, and then realising that I can know and then build upon that without having been to Baghdad, without having met <coughs> Saddam, whereas as a journalist I would never feel qualified to be able mm. to do that. Of course. Um, so I guess that's when I hit my stride. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I like the idea of hitting your stride and sort of just being, a, you know, nailing the tone and then going from there. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get too caught up in teasing out commonality in both your works. Um, and if we get to them, I do have some questions for you individually. But you've both written Melbourne into these books. Um, and I love reading Melbourne. I don't know about other readers in the room. But it just feels like such a treat to read your own city. Um, but of course, you've also written Prague and Baghdad and North Dakota. And I just wondered, was it, is it easier or harder to write a city you know well? Um, I was working completely from memory, so this flat is real. It's my first home. Yeah. I'm, it's um, a place that I treasure um, in my whole body, in every cell. 
um, the Prague bits were harder because I absolutely wanted to get it right. Again, I didn't want a cliche of communist Prague and luckily, just by absolute chance, my cousin Martin, who grew up with his grandma, who was my grandma's sister, just found me on Facebook. I haven't seen him for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And he was driving for a film company, so he had a lot of time on his hand waiting on set. And he'd just message me every day and just be like, Favour, ask me a question, because he wanted to be back in that flat just like I did. Mm -hmm. So that was amazing, <coughs> like the stories. And just that, that amount of research, I could just ask him everything, like what he had for lunch at school, what would he buy if he found 20 cents, what was his favourite lolly, what was his favourite meal. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> everything and then I felt like I had the permission to be a young boy in Prague running around those streets. Before that I was like nervous about those sure. scenes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Melbourne was all just memory. Yeah, same. I mean Melbourne was easy, uh, yeah. born and bred. Um, yeah, and with, with the countries and the places that I don't know, just an intense amount of research. I mean, luckily with war, soldiers are obsessed with writing their own memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> so you like you get all those memoirs, and um, yeah, like, like it's, and you can just you just build a picture. I mean, there's fantastic war reporters whose work I drew on, and then with North North Dakota, there was incredible amount of uh, reporting from there, which cool. I drew on as well. Yeah. 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 So, changing tact slightly, Favel, you're coming off to hugely successful and beloved novels. And Anna, as I said, we consider you a journalistic non-fiction writer. Um, I wondered if it was a daunting task to write a third novel for you, Favel, and a debut for you, Anna. And obviously, writing anything is daunting, but you come to it with these histories. This one I didn't think would be published, so I just gave myself full permission to go wow. with it. I um found some Czechoslovakian gherkins in Northland Shopping Land <laughs> when I was lost in there and I haven't seen these gherkins since I was 16 and I bought all of them. <laughs> and and um, the gherkins are in incredibly important to the book, yeah. I feel. I'm not, <laughs> I mean, that is, that's a funny thing to say, but it's true. But I eventually found my car, got out of that Northland and I had a warm gherkin and... Um, <laughs> And I just like wet. I just started yeah. to cry, and um, it, I, all I wanted to do was drive to this flat, to run up those stairs, and for these two people mm. to be there, and to share this ritual that was every day, a roll and um, with sausage and cheese inside, and on the side of each plate was a gherkin, one for me, one for my grandma, one for my grandpa. Um, that was the day I started writing. Like so, the tears. I was like, oh, all right, this has to come out like now. And also, I need to know more about my grandparents. Mm. And um, but I just never knew that it would be published. I just never imagined that it would be interesting to anyone. That's so even interesting. Though it's your th even yeah, though you'd exactly. already been published. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But it mm. didn't matter. I had to once it started. I had to see it through. Yeah, right. It was yeah. an mm. obsessive process. I became a complete recluse for a year and a half, and I only wanted to be with the work. I just wanted to be with my grandma and granddad in this room and so it was a very special yeah. intense my most intense writing I drafted more than I've ever drafted before 15 to 20 times each scene till every word was perfect rhythm till it was just the essence because I felt like my grandparents were there and I wanted it to be perfect for mm. them I actually think that's a perfect moment before Anna answers for you to read mm, sure. from um, your yep. section so this is the flat my home. Melbourne, 1980. Our footsteps echo as we climb the stairs. My grandma holds my hand. Shh, be quiet. My grandpa is sleeping. The third floor flat, the heavy wooden door and inside the smell of warm pipe tobacco and homemade cakes. Home. Take off your coat, hang it on the coat rack. Take off your shoes, put them on the shoe rack. Put on your slippers. Mine are red and my grandma's are blue. My grandpa's are brown, but they are in his room where he is sleeping. Down the hall, past my grandma's bedroom and past my grandpa's bedroom, past the green tiled bathroom and into the small light kitchen. 
My grandma puts the cloth shopping bag on the table. It has flowers on it and zips up into a small leather wallet when it is not being used. It is a good bag and it holds a lot. It comes from Czechoslovakia. I unpack the shopping, three Kaiser rolls, a wrapped paper parcel with six slices of Swiss cheese inside, a paper parcel with six slices of Parisa sausage inside, a loaf of rye bread with caraway seeds, a jar of Nova gherkins, one round black and green tin, Dr. Pat pipe tobacco for my grandpa. My grandma fills up the kettle over the sink and sets it on the stove. She lights a match and the gas ring explodes blue. Pfft, that sweet smell of gas. My grandma blows out the match then breaks it in half with her fingers. She drops the broken match into a glass ashtray. It is full of match halves, one half clean, the other half blackened and burnt. I hear the toilet flush. My grandpa is awake. My grandma scoops loose tea into the shiny teapot. She smiles at me and then begins to sing. One, two, three, grandma caught a flea, put it in the teapot, made a cup of tea. The flea jumped out, grandma gave a shout. Here comes grandpa with his shirt hanging out. I join in with that last line and just like that, my grandpa opens the kitchen door. He's wearing his white singlet and striped pajama bottoms and his brown slippers, his face still puffy with sleep. I laugh at his crazy sticking up hair at the way he always looks so surprised to be alive. He sits down at the green table next to me. He pats my head. My grandma makes the tea. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you doing the audio book? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> you should. I know. I, should. That, I can do that bit well. <laughs> the whole book is hard to read. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so, Anna, did you feel any, any pressure? Oh, <laughs> tumbling books. Um, no, well, so, uh, we've, we've, uh, okay, so I had two babies in really quick succession, mm -hmm. and, um, I'd always loved fiction, poetry, and journalism, but journalism had taken the lead, and it, one probably thing with journalism is that news never stops, so it just never stopped taking the lead, so then I had two babies, and, um, I couldn't, I knew I couldn't do journalism how I like to do it, which mm. is to disappear. Yeah. Um, and sort of pop up later and not really know and just sort of immerse myself in the story. So I thought, hey, I'll, I'll, write, the, I'll write a novel <laughs> now because babies. Um, yeah, they love it when you just yeah, leave so them easy. alone for they're hours. They're so <laughs> obedient. Um, they're like, oh, mum, would you like would you like to work now? <laughs> I'll take that nap. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, no one sleeps and they never have. Um, but I still thought this is my moment. Um, and I'll do it. So I think for the first two years, it was literally like this, uh, my non-fiction muscle was so fit. It was like it could do marathons, it could do everything. And my fiction muscle was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, you want me to do a star jump? And it was like, I feel like the first two years were like, come on, come on. And, and just sort of getting this thing into like elasticity again. Yeah. And um, then it started to work. Then it started to flow. And I, I started to trust it and started to follow it um, and trust the intuition. Um, so... I mean, I think, yeah, there, I was, there was trepidation, not about, like, um, um, its, its exit into the world, more mm. just about me being alone with it. Mm. Um, and so a couple of times I would be like, I'm going to do that quarterly essay because <laughs> um, this is really just between me and the, and the novel, uh, I really need to go, just go to the 
look at Adani instead because because right. um, <laughs> uh, it just it just was so it just it was, it's so hard to tell yourself that you have purpose and it's meaning whereas with journalism you've got that that cliche which I don't even agree with but you're shining a light into dark places right. and um you know when you do feel like you you have no meaning you can sort of fill yourself up with that sense of importance whereas with fiction it's it's hard, mm. it's really hard and mm. you don't really, you can't say that you're doing anything until you've done it yeah. and um, so it was more just the process and trusting that process that was hard for me. Yeah, yeah. I could imagine that. Um, so changing tack again, um, there's a beautiful musicality to both these books. Fable, you have Holst and the Planets playing as well as the Rolling Stones. And Anna, of course, you have Nassim playing piano for Saddam Hussein. Mm. Mm. Um, and they're some of the most memorable scenes. I think I'll, they'll never leave me. Um, and then, of course, there's musicality in your language. Um, can you talk a bit about the role music plays in your work? Mm. Am I overstating its significant? No, it felt significant no. reading both your no, books. No, no, it's massive. Yeah. F firstly, the, this flat... Um, was just filled with classical music. The only time the TV was on is if there was a Czech player playing tennis <laughs> and then we'd all have to watch. <laughs> um, the rest of the time was classical music. Um, and so that was really important to just fill my writing space with the music that my grandpa would listen to. Um, but there's other interesting things about music. Th there's one song by the Moody Blues called Nights in White Satin, it was with me through the whole writing process. Like, I don't even like the Moody Blues. <laughs> I, I had to listen to that song every single day. Wow. And um, I, I just thought, oh, well, it's a song of the times. I remember it being on in the car, you know, late 70s. But when I did Richard Feidler the other week in Sydney, he, he's an expert on Prague, an incredible expert, and he's writing a book on the history of Prague mm. coming out next year which will be amazing, I'm sure. But he said, oh, Fable, did you choose uh, Nights in White Satin? Because in 1968, just on the eve of Russia, like, rolling in with the tanks, Moody Blues were doing their, like, film clip on the Charles Bridge and blah, 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 and there's a whole documentary about it. <laughs> I and you um, said yes. <laughs> no, I said no, I had no idea. <laughs> and, but it just, I was like, oh, mm, or maybe yeah. I did have some idea or yeah. somebody had some idea and they were like pushing me towards this yeah. song that I don't even like. But music's <laughs> really important in all my, well, the last yeah. two novels. Yeah. Mm. They've almost got a soundtrack. Yeah. And yeah. same with yours. Yeah, I think so. Um, I also think um, sometimes, uh, I guess it's also a process, like um, I sort of, sort of write according to my medium. So if I'm mm. writing for a newspaper, I sort of feel that I, I'm writing a staccato. Right. Yeah, and when I'm writing for a magazine, it's a little bit of staccato and a little bit of melody, and when it lengthens, it's really melodic. Right. Um, so but I, I really do think like that, um, and I know other people think, think oh, they write sort of a different kind of notation or all those kind of things, or their um, the grammar or the punctuation really... Um, shapes their work, but I, I shape it to a sound, yeah. It, it, so we're, we're hardwired <laughs> for rhythm mm. as human beings. Writing is rhythm. It yeah. sings, like Anna's novel sings, it, like good writing sings, if you know what I mean. It, mm. yeah. it's, it is musical. Yeah. Um, I think that's a perfect moment to hear some of yeah, your music, Anna. Please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not doing my audio book. <laughs> <laughs> Way too many accents. Yeah. <laughs> so this is from the third chapter, which is called Saddam's Horses. It's quite funny that we cho I chose this one. Nassim's mother had played the piano, nor couldn't read music and had always regretted it, compensating by arranging lessons for her daughter. Nassim took to it like breathing, her mother attributed this to the lessons, but Nassim knew it was the hours she had watched Noor play, memorising how she felt her way along the keys, gently forming sounds into chords and wincing when she hit an off note. Her melodies went unrecorded, 
fleeting as clouds, but engraved on the Sem's bones. Noor Amin was a celebrated poet. She was called a true Iraqi, commended for stripping the British influence from her poetry, for her love of country and her revolutionary spirit. A modern woman, Noor was often out at meetings and readings, openings and lectures, salons and dinner parties, while Nassim's father stayed home in the evenings to look after Nassim. When her mother was home, it was mostly to work in her study or to bask in the company of many guests, including visitors from other countries who brought Nassim gifts and sang her songs in curious languages until she was bustled to bed while Noor held the guest in thrall. It was often said that Noor Amin's poetry was like rain to a desert, but in conversation she spoke plainly and with a delicious humour that few dared. People both feared and loved her honesty. Noor despised the black abayas worn by the Shia woman. They are like garbage bags, she had sneered to Nassim once as they walked behind a flock of them on the street. And at the parties her parents held, her mother would laugh at someone's half-hearted case for modesty. Modesty, she would say, modesty. Look at them in the market. They're the pushiest, rudest woman there. Once Noor imitated a goose to illustrate her point. She pushed her chin out, puckered her lips and shouldered everyone out of her way as she grabbed cakes from the table and clutched them to her chest, a wet hiss issuing from her lips. Everyone laughed in recognition. For their husbands, someone called out. At this, Noor stopped and looked over at her husband, a sheer man, and smiled sweetly. Forgive me, my dear, she said, picking up a throw and dropping it over her head, arms outstretched as she made howling sounds, blindly searching for him. My darling husband, she called, it is me, your modest, stupid wife. <laughs> Chuckling, he ran around the room as she tried to catch him until the guests caught him for her, and she embraced him clumsily, still howling like a ghost. Her mother would apologise later, Nassim watching as she whispered in her father's ear, seeing his smile as he put his arms around her. But she was merciless. I'm sure your mother was a wonderful slave, Noor added loudly. Many ventured that Noor had Bedouin blood. It was a compelling thought, for her eyes were the copper of sand vipers, and her oval face was rugged with freckles. But it was more than that. She had unyielding quality, that reminded her admirers of the much romanticised desert Arab, something unbending, a streak that would not, could not adapt. At the time, Noor Amin's piano playing was an afterthought. It was something she did in private, like prayer. But then everything changed. It happened after Nassim's 10th birthday. She was in bed, her father having tucked her in, and she lay awake listening to the dinner party downstairs. She was in the habit of holding her breath so the sound of her breathing would not get in the way of her mother's voice, which flowed into song as the night thickened, joined by the twang of her father on the oud. The doorbell rang. It often did, but this time after the door was opened there was a strange hush, followed by movement as chairs were dragged across the floor and then a frenzied popping of corks and clinking of glasses. Nassim got out of bed and propped her door ajar to listen. The laughter and the music had resumed, her mother's voice still bell-like, but there was something new, an unease in her tone. Nassim, in her white nightdress with pink ribbon threaded through the bosom, tiptoed to the top of the stairs, peering down between the banisters. At first she did not see anything beyond the flurry of guests, but then, in an opening of bodies, she saw him. He was sitting in their best armchair, handsome, he looked just like he did on the posters, dark eyes kind and interested, eyebrows bushy and brooding. On television, the Sim's favourite part was when he rode his horse, an Arabian mare, Al Awa, named after the Prophet Muhammad's favoured horse, meaning the one-eyed mare. Her mother liked him too. This Nassim knew because she had heard her defending him once. He's bringing Iraq into the 20th century, she said, when a guest voiced disapproval of his harsh methods. And now he was here, in their home, listening avidly to her mother. Nassim was so excited she felt her chest might burst. She flew back to her bedroom and sat on her mattress, hugging her knees and holding her breath, listening for the voice of Saddam. Such a great moment. Whew. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, this, this, the Saddam Hussein, I mean, so all of those scenes are just so memorable. I feel like they're seared into my brain yeah. forever. So thank you for that. Um, I'm now going to ask you some individual questions about some specific elements of your work. Um, Fable, we've talked about food, but I want to talk about details more broadly. I feel that you're just very good at detail um, and getting those details right. And I wondered how you sort of see and select the details to include. Um, because I really feel it's these details that allow you to capture the extraordinary in the seemingly ordinary. Mm -hmm. um, food, my grandma was an incredible cook. Everything was Czech. I don't know if anyone's had Czech food. It's incredibly mm. delicious, <laughs> incredibly unhealthy. <laughs> um, a Czech salad is cucumber cut up and, and um, put in a bowl of cream. Mm. So, um, and you drink the cream. So... Um, yeah, that's a Czech salad. Um, <laughs> and you have characters just wishing for fried food. Yeah. yeah cause it's all my grandma could get all, me and all of my cousins to eat any vegetable because it was covered in butter and honey. Right. So even cabbage. Like, um, <laughs> she was an amazing cook. Um, I'll never forget her food. I wanted to be with that food again. Mm. She didn't leave any recipes. Everything was by, by heart. Yeah. Um, so I can't make any of it properly. <laughs> um, details, are, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. They're important. Things like the telephone, I find mm. the details of the telephone were really important in this book and, and food. But I did get some of the food wrong. My cousin was the first reader, this beautiful man who had helped me so much with the Czech research. Mm. Um, the book had to be okay with him. So I sent it to him and I was very nervous. Czech people can be quite blunt. <laughs> um, and I, the first message I got back was, Favel, have you had a head injury? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, ooh. And what he was angry about is I'd had a scene where the family's eating chicken snitchel with potato dumplings and oh. then that's just not no. done. No. Okay. <laughs> Do not have chicken snitcher no with potato dumplings. Right. Whatever was I thinking? <laughs> What's wrong with me? Clearly the head injury. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to change that to fried potato. Okay. And that's okay? That fried was okay. okay. He was happy with that. Then the next message was that um, he'd been crying for four days, mm. which was amazing to me because I'd made everything up. But somehow with the details, mm. I'd got something right emotionally it's interesting yeah. I don't know there's a part of writing that is unexplainable that is mm. magic when you're completely there with the character and the voice and creating this whole world there is a magic that happens that I don't know how it happens but it does it's there in the silences it's there in around the words there's a whole iceberg under the surface mm. that is all the drafts all the thinking all the heart all the research it's all there mm. but it's not there actually on the page in type mm. it's just there it's magic i don't know how you do that but, <laughs> but you manage it it's yeah. magic um, by hard work yes yeah, right. by, by in, yeah. incredibly intense mm. hard work yeah. yeah you're right yeah. yeah well speaking of hard work anna um in your book you throw so many narrative strands into the air mm. it's truly masterful how did you make sure that they all landed <laughs> how did you do that oh as in like what do you mean landed well it, you, you have so many things happening, you have so many characters, you've, you, mm. you traverse the world and your characters are developing and changing throughout your book. Mm. You've got time slips, uh, you all have to read this book, it's hard <laughs> to... <laughs> um, and so you just, you just had so much that you had to bring together mm. and how did you do that? How I do remember with the last draft, um, sitting there with my editor and um, my other editor as well and we were just mapping out continuity yeah and literally like mapping out e each person's timeline and sort of saying oh hang on if Saddam was executed on that year would that match up to that person's timeline and so having to match up all these events and I guess that's sort of what happens with a film is you're mm. constantly working out continuity and we had to do that that was 
that was um that was definitely not in my own head that was like quite at the end when we really had to make sure that we got in all the pieces fitting correctly um uh but how their lives tangled and untangled and landed um mm. <laughs> i didn't really know until the end myself right um I, I, some people plot everything out i had like it was as much as a mystery to me as like it wasn't planned okay that's yeah. interesting yeah Okay, wow. Well, mm. It's all the more impressive, really. <laughs> um, Fable, this book is a departure for you in many ways, um, but I wondered how you see it as different <coughs> to what and how you've written in the past. Well, it doesn't have Tasmania in it or any, <laughs> any water. There's I didn't no, want to bring up Tasmania, but... <laughs> there's no water at all. Yeah. It's a gent... It's more gentle, but there's more feeling in it. Yeah. It's, um, like I said, it's been my most intense writing. It, it might not be my best book, but I think it's my best writing, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, it is different, yeah. It was just a full passion love. It's a love letter to my grandparents. It's what it is, basically, and trying to um, give myself... Um, well, create um, the story of their life that I'll never know. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we are made up of stories and da dates and facts we can find out at any point, but they're kind of meaningless. What's meaningful is, um, you know, when did when did my grandma first fall in love? What mm -hmm. what made her heart break? What did she love to do when she was young? I'll never know these things. Mm -hmm. They're gone, but. I, to be with them and to create this past for these people was just um, a very special yeah. time. Yeah, it's a very special book. Um, we'll go to audience questions in just a moment. Um, Anna, I just wanted to ask you, I've um, been thinking a lot about your, your body of work mm. and trying to find threads through all of it. Mm. I don't know, it's something I enjoy doing. Um, and for me, I think the common thread is you trying to navigate through the fog of moral complexity. Hmm. I might be wrong, that's, that's my interpretation. <laughs> and I just wondered, what is it about these grey areas, this ambiguity, this complexity? You don't make it easy on yourself no. in any of your work. <laughs> um, but what is it that draws you in? <clears throat> it's just far more interesting. Right. Um, I just think that there are far more interesting conversations to be had when you go to to when you search for nuance. Um, I also think it, um, uh, I mean, I would love one, one of favorite, one of my favorite essays is by Zadie Smith and it's Fail Better. Mm -hmm. And she talks about how bad writing is cliches and bad writing is stereotypes and, and, um, and caricatures. But she doesn't just say it's bad writing, she says it's unethical. And I totally and utterly agree with her. And I think in journalism, it's um, more prevalent. Uh, but there's these cliches of sex equals fun, e cliches of hunger, um, eating equals hunger. And, and it's just none of that can be true. Um, mm. Eating could equal sadness. Um, sex can equal banality. Um, so all these, I just think um, there's, I, yeah, I love digging up um, moral complexities because there's so much is assumed mm. when people sort of take on a moral platform. Um, so, um, for instance, uh, Nassim turns out to be a refugee whose, if her history were to be discovered, she would be sent back mm. um, because she's not a legitimate uh, refugee, but, God, she's a human one. Yeah. And I think so often that these uh, conversations devolve into we should only save the innocents as opposed to what's your humanity and mm. what's theirs. Mm. Um, and to be a victim, um, this idea that a victim can only be innocent is just so ridiculous and so um, such a malnourished conversation. Mm. So I guess that's that's I, I always love rounding and fleshing those things out. Yeah, I think yeah. you're the kind of person who just questions everything, right? 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the joys of my family. <laughs> okay, we're now going to open up to questions from the audience. We do have roving microphones, so please put your hand up and wait for a microphone to come to you. Do we have any questions from the audience? I've got a lot more. Great. Um, do your parents have a presence in your book? Um, I, I deliberately... Um, Did you kill them? Black, <laughs> like, just <laughs> I've deliberately blacked out the middle generation. Mm. Um, I did it because this is a story um, between grandkids and grandmas um, and I needed it to just be their story. The middle generation have a very different story to mm. tell. Mm. So my dad knows these two people in a very different way than I do. Um, it, and, um, but I felt like this was my story. These are my grandparents mm. and I'm going to tell it. And that middle generation can just be gone. <laughs> there is one mother in it, um, mm. so my cousin's mother, and she really was a dancer and mm. she really did travel with the Black Lake Theatre of Prague. So she was away for 11 months of the year. One thing that people probably don't know the story of is grandmas ran Eastern Europe. <laughs> I really mean it. Mm. Every single adult had to have a job. You couldn't stay at home with your children, no matter how many you had, no matter how, um, even if it was a newborn. Um, if you didn't have a job, the state found you one. Um, and so grandmas, retired, had done all this before, suddenly taking care of everything getting food, making sure that there's someone to look after children all the time, getting kids to school, etc., etc. They, like, kept the world spinning and nobody knows their story. Mm. So I needed them to be the heroines of this mm. story, not the middle generation. Mm. Hope that answers the question. Mm. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, there's one right at the front. This really is about education. The thing I'm really worried about is that people aren't nuanced because they don't have enough vocabulary. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's not a question, really. But it's <laughs> no, I guess it's about, about it. literacy. About yeah, literacy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have found that troubling as well, um, especially when you have children. Um, so I've sort of gone back into the education system in a way. Um, and, yeah, I do find some aspects of education and curriculum quite troubling. Um, watch this space. I am. I am going to actually. I'm actually am working on it as a result. But um, yeah, I think if you don't, um, this could well be the result of a poorly applied education, um, uh, under fire funded schools, totally unsupported teachers, um, and um, yeah, we're reaping the results. Yeah. We have time for a couple more questions. There's one just in the third row. Uh, oh, just wait for the microphone, please. Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, Fable, I've read um, When the Night Comes, which yep. I think was your second yes. novel. Yeah. Um, but from memory, that was also written from the point of view of a young girl. <coughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering whether that is... A, a pattern for you or, or, or something that particularly fascinates you? Um, so my first book is two young boys. Oh, no, no, oh. no, no. And the second one is a young girl and that that is got a lot of truth to it as well, a lot of memories of Hobart and um, this time of being, you know, about 13. Um, I don't know. I'm fascinated by the voice of children I feel like children are constantly trying to work out what adults are doing and what's going on and they can sense all the energy mm. but they don't quite understand everything. So it's interesting. They understand more than we think. They're picking up on uh, so many different levels things that are going on. Um, so I find it fascinating. I always also think um, children are completely um, at the mercy of adults' decisions and um, mm. for good or bad, that's also interesting to me. So, yes, I, um, all three books are from the point of view of, of children. 
Well, you've both written in your books from the point of view of children. Yes. Um, mm. Well, it's in certain sections at least. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. Um, and it's something, mm. it, you know, any reader can immediately detect falsehood in the note of when books are written by children. And you both do it incredibly well and it's a very hard thing to do. And yeah, sorry, that's just my personal Thank opinion. You so <laughs> do we have another question? I do, if no one else does. Um, I've read, I heard you say, Anna, that your book started as short stories. Yes, yeah. And Favor, I've, I think I've heard you say that you thought that this would be a short story or at mm -hmm. least part of it yep. would be a short Absolutely. story. So how did the books evolve into the novels that we read today? Mm. Uh, well, characters kept turning up in the wrong story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pesky characters. Um, <laughs> And I guess also that sense of, um, oh, I guess in a sense of wanting to write a novel that reflects the times or a work that reflects the times, I guess it needed to be bigger than short stories in that I wanted to show how things done seemingly very separate from one um, scenario can actually end up affecting something all the way over there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, decisions to go into Iraq, um, you know, might seem so utterly far away and so um, detached from our way of life, and yet the consequences will do continue to fall on us and um, are still rising up in other countries and it's almost like we've set off a fever um, that is still going. Mm. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, uh, this idea that, you know, that... We, uh, I, I, how, I don't can't but this couldn't make Australian characters that don't travel and, or don't get caught up in in a in a dance rave uh, in another country or end up going to a protest in another country because it seems increasingly that life is not simply Australian it's mm -hmm. it's global and we're we really are overwhelmingly sometimes connected um, so I guess in that sense the stories didn't suit. The, the what I was doing. Not that I knew what I was doing, <laughs> but it just didn't suit it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like the idea of characters appearing where they, they're not meant to be, where yeah. they, were, they were somewhere else and now suddenly they're here. Yeah, they walk into a restaurant, <laughs> like, what are you two doing here? <laughs> and Fable, how was it? Um, how was I it think all, all, all of my books start off as short pieces. This was a short story about gherkins. <laughs> um, the gherkins are really no, important. No, they are. Uh, yeah. Um, and delicious. And, and delicious, uh, yeah. <laughs> so my grandparents would save their coins and put them in a gherkin jar and um, the coins in four or five years would turn into aeroplane tickets back to Prague. They were working class. They didn't ever own a house. It was very hard for them to save mm. to go. It was the most important thing in their lives though. Um, so it started off as this short story um, but it had more life. You know when a short story has got more life. It mm. won't go away. There's more. There's more. Now I've got this other boy and he's running around Prague and mm. what's this about? Wow. Never saw that coming. Um, that was amazing and he was a joy to write. So then you just want more, 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 more. And then it's a novel. But I think <laughs> all of my short stories are novels or mm. could be and probably with you as well. And they, some of them have that feeling they've got way more life, but we don't have time to write everyone <laughs> into a novel, so. Yeah. yeah, that's a lovely idea. Elizabeth Gilbert talks about that a little bit in a TED talk and in Big Magic as well, that ideas come to you and you can accept them and bring them to life or you can thank them and send them on to another writer. <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea. And then they appear in your book with your <laughs> character <laughs> in the wrong story. Yeah, maybe that's where they're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I think we need to end it there. We're, we are a bit out of time. Um, just a reminder that Josh from Readings will be selling copies of both of these extraordinary books and I would highly encourage you to buy them, read them, get these wonderful writers to sign them for you up the back. Um, could you please join me in thanking Favel and Anna? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.